We're going to kick off this video by announcing a little bit of a rebrand. You might see that the YouTube channel is renamed, all that other fun stuff. So rear, wherever the, wherever it is, uh, wherever it is. So that was the reptile in for information review, which of course the initials are RIR. And as you just heard me say, I generally pronounce it as rear. It was a little bit of a satire, a little bit of a joke, but I don't think anybody really got it. But to help you kind of understand if the channel was called rear and you're getting information of it, you were pulling information from your, yeah, okay, hopefully you figured that out. If not, it doesn't matter. It was a very low effort channel and uh, the idea was to get people to at least, you know, consider some of these things. But instead the whole thing went downhill with a bunch of people sending me all sorts of ridiculous comments. Justin Smith hit me with uh, a copyright strike because he didn't like what I had to say. Um, you know, like a, a, a bunch of really ridiculous stuff. There's so much ridiculous stuff in the reptile hobby, which brings us to the topic of today's video. Uh, let's jump over to top 10 mistakes that the reptile hobby will always make. They will always make these mistakes. As long as I've been in this hobby, you will always see the exact same things repeated. Uh, and it's great. It's great. Um, it's great if you like comedy, that is. It's not great for the animals. It's not great for anybody involved. Uh, let's go ahead and kick this thing over to presentation mode. Um, doo -doo -doo. There we go. So uh, we should have, yep, okay. People always think that the reptile hobby is somehow bigger than it actually is. Uh, you know, they'll say, oh, I have a successful YouTube channel. I've got 5,000 views. 5,000 views? I could start a team fight tactics channel. I could start a Minecraft channel. I could probably start a crochet channel specifically geared toward discussing social issues in television while I crochet and I will have more views than you. That's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. It's, I mean, that, that in itself should be a little bit of a faux pas or a, uh, um, you should laugh at people that say that. Let's put it that way. So, uh, you know, I've had people come at me before that, you know, Liam Seclair especially had a whole conversation with me, turned around and said, well, where's your YouTube channel? Uh, I made one that was a joke. Um, and so now I'm gonna make one that I take probably 10% more serious. Um, not because I want to compete with reptiles and research as a, as a YouTube channel, because I also don't want to compete with anything else that's satirical, ridiculous. I don't want to go ahead and compete with Joe Rogan experience because I don't like Joe Rogan. That's not, that's not how any of this works. But people like that think that because they've got a little bit of a following inside of reptiles, because they run a Facebook group, because they have, you know, what, whatever, it doesn't matter, They're, because they have followers on Twitter or whatever, that they somehow, you know, know more than somebody else, which by itself should be, you know, kind of a kind of a logical fallacy in itself, a little bit of critical thinking that doesn't really work out. Anyway, so the hobby has, of course, you know, expanded uh, several times over the last few years. During the pandemic, we actually had a lot of animal hoarding, uh, which isn't great for the reptiles, of course. Uh, people didn't have anything to do, so of course they went and jumped into this hobby and argued with people on the internet, and then ultimately when they had to go back to work, realized that they had to sell all these things. Uh, unfortunately, that's not great for the animals, not great for keepers, not great for the reptile hobby. But it is what it is. Ultimately, this is a little tiny hobby, and all the videos you see of Tenley and Arlington and stuff like that, I think I have furry conventions in my area that will put both of them to shame. The reptile hobby is small. It's small. These people aren't as big a fish as they think they are. That's, that's just the, the end of that. Um, so we're going to jump over to, you know, a big majority opinion is that Arcadia is the standard of ethical keeping because they have all these little specialty lamps. Uh, fun fact, though, is all those little specialty lamps, you know, are under technologies that are literally antiquated and slowly being phased out. Now, of course, Arcadia is going to be able to weasel itself into a position where they say these are specialty lamps that can't be replaced. That's not true whatsoever. If you want to offer lighting to your animals, if you want plant lights, move to LEDs, move to LEDs in the rest of your house. Follow the guidelines of even your own government in certain situations where they say that fluorescent lamps and incandescent bulbs are no longer efficient uh, and they are phasing them out. That's just simply the way it is. The reptile hobby should move forward. Uh, if Arcadia really wanted to have ethical keeping, uh, then they would dump money into research about LEDs and not call them fail technologies and not come out with dimmable T5s. Speaking of dimmable T5s, like if you if you look at it, a dimmable T5 that they claim is supposed to, you know, mimic the sun, that doesn't mimic the sun whatsoever. During the dawn, during the dusk, the actual UVA versus UVB ratios are completely different and the dimming bulb is not going to offer that. 
Uh, on top of that, you know, you're supposed to go ahead and burn in bulbs before you dim them, which I don't think Arcadia even mentions. So once again, John Courtney Smith just gets light bulbs wrong. If you go and you look at the Animals at Home Network podcast, he tries to explain a fluorescent lamp, how it melts mercury, and this, the bunch of this stuff is just bananas. A uh, fluorescent lamp isn't designed to melt mercury. That's not what it's for. Uh, if your fluorescent lamp does need to heat the mercury and vaporize it, that means you live in Siberia. Um, your reptile has frozen to death and it doesn't need UV anymore. These basic concepts of UV lamps, which are lamps that are over 100 years old, should not escape Arcadia whatsoever. Uh, anyway, so the other part of Arcadia that I'm not sure a lot of people know is Arcadia Reptile used to be Arcadia Burden Reptile, and it used to be on the shelf right next to the Arcadia Aquarium products. Every PetSmart is slap full of Arcadia products. The thing that I think escapes some people's attention is that Arcadia Reptile, of course, wanted a piece of that pie as well and jumped in, and now they rebox Arcadia bulbs as PetSmart's Thrive brand. Now, you might think this is good because people going to PetSmart should be able to get higher quality, which we'll cover that in a minute, uh, equipment in order to be more successful with the reptiles that they impulse buy and then buy all-in-one cages for. This is, this is not great. PetSmart at one point in time actually had a little AR thingy where they wanted people to sit there and compete in quizzes for, you know, to find out if they got, you know, good scores. This is a real thing. You can see on the screen right there, it's a real thing. They had a little thing where you could take a picture of yourself, a little Snapchat filter type thing where you have a leopard gecko over your head because you're so smart at leopard gecko. This is not, this is not great. This of course aligned with everything PetSmart. Now the reason that I bring this up is because, especially in you know uh, kind of modern, modern types of politics, stuff like that, you always see that people are only as good as the people they associate with. So if you find out somebody associates with something that you don't like, or some political thing that you don't like, or some social issue that you don't like, then a lot of people move away. Now I'm not telling you to cancel Arcadia, but I'm telling you that the people that run around saying that this is ethical, this is not ethical, I'm not going to buy from that person because they buy from New England Reptile, something like that. For some reason, they'll buy from Arcadia even though they are helping to get people into a store to impulse buy leopard geckos based on an AR. It's, it's completely ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous. Now, of course, if we ask Arcadia to step up to the plate and actually innovate so that we don't have hazardous waste, we don't have hazardous bulbs, uh, we can get rid of the incandescent bulbs that are really power inefficient. We can get rid of some of these other heat sources and reptiles that are totally inefficient. Uh, they're not going to do it. That's going to cost too much money. They've already got contracts with the light bulb manufacturers. They're never going to step up. So Arcadia is not the ethical be-all, end-all source of reptile keeping. They just sell equipment just like anybody else. It's the same thing as me saying that Toyota is more ethical than Nissan. It doesn't it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Uh, now, this is one of my favorites, and I put this high up on the list because I think it's very silly, and people are already probably doing this in the middle of my video, uh, and I don't mind. So one of the things that, I mean, I guess it's across the internet, but especially in the reptile hobby, uh, people like to scream, oh, that's an ad hominem, and then they've won the fight because they called an ad hominem. Unfortunately, they have no idea what an ad hominem is, and they don't know how to use logical fallacies. So, uh, so let's jump into that. Uh, I've given you two examples here. So if I was to say Liam is wrong about thermometers, he is an idiot and you shouldn't listen to him. That's an ad hominem. Why is it an ad hominem? Is because I've used a personal attack for my argument. I haven't actually addressed any argument. I've just said he's an idiot. And that's why his argument is invalid. That's not how a debate works. Now, the second example, Liam is an idiot and he thinks thermometers shoot lasers that bounce off of surfaces to get a temperature reading. Now, that provides an actual argument that is counter argument to something that he said. That's not an ad hominem, that's just me adding some tacky flavor text to my argument. Not an ad hominem. On top of that, if you are to call an illogical fallacy, wow, couldn't say that one. Uh, if you were to call a logical fallacy in the middle of a debate, that just means the other person should restructure their argument and deliver it again. It doesn't mean that you've won the debate. Debates, in big air quotes, in the reptile hobby are such a ridiculous topic, it is a car wreck to watch. I remember Animals at Home Network actually had a debate with rat keepers versus vivariums or some nonsense like that. And there was so much anecdotal stuff, there was nothing that really constituted as a real argument. The counter arguments were completely wrong. Dylan, who was supposed to be host of the show, wasn't saying, you know, hold up a minute, what is the actual argument here? Uh, it wasn't a debate whatsoever. I think at one point in time, Liam even claimed that ball pythons hunt birds and trees using UV vision. 
that does not physics does not work like that little buddy uh, that should have been called out as you're not even making any sense and you're just trying to create supportive arguments for you to offer UV light, which also doesn't make any sense. So yeah, debates, ad hominems, logical fallacies, the reptile hobby, generally most of online are completely nonsensical, especially that everybody loves screaming ad hominem. You can provide all of the arguments in the world that completely invalidate everybody's other arguments and they'll still scream ad hominem and then beat their chest like they've won. Silly, silly people. Homeoth bleh, round two, uh, the real way that you're supposed to say it is homeopathic and homeopathy. Now, this is basically nature cures nature kind of situation when it comes to reptiles. They try to say that in order for a reptile to be healthy and happy, then it must have the exact same requirements as nature. This is not the way that we, uh, we really treat any other animal. It's, it's really not. So when you look at the way people keep dogs and cats, we don't say that you have to reline your entire house with dirt. Uh, we don't say that you have to have UV lamps for them. In fact, it's been proven that UV lamps don't do anything. Uh, we deliver them things like box diets uh, or however you want to say it, canned food, you know, stuff that already has balanced nutrition specifically for dogs and cats in it. Uh, of course, sometimes that goes haywire and other times people try to feed them vegan diets and that's completely ridiculous. Luckily, I hope we don't have that going on in reptiles, but whatever. The point that I'm trying to make here is that commonly kept pets do not suffer, suffer as much as reptiles do when it comes to people trying to claim that nature is going to cure nature. Uh, they're, they're going to try that you, you should, or they're going to say that you shouldn't use, you know, modern chemicals instead of using something like quaternary ammonias, you should use something like vinegar. The sad news that I have is vinegar actually is a chemical because literally everything is a chemical. And I don't know what grandma they got this stuff from calling everything bad chemicals, but whatever, whatever. Um, Vinegar, and this, is, this has been well studied. This is well studied. I'm not gonna provide a source for this because you should be able to find it on your own and it's very well studied. Vinegar does not have as much effectiveness as something like a quaternary ammonia. Now, quaternary ammonia has been proven to be relatively safe among people and animals. Sure, there's some people that have reactions. There will be people that have reactions to everything. Uh, but this is just one tool that we have. If a quaternary ammonia doesn't work, maybe you switch to a chlorhexidine, maybe you switch to 10% uh, bleach, whatever it is. But the point being, vinegar does not work. Vinegar is not the answer. Just because it's natural, vinegar is not the answer. That's, uh, that's really silly. Manuka honey is not the answer. You should go and seek actual medical advice and medical help if there's something wrong with your animal. Daylight, sunlight, that stuff's not going to cure people. That's, that's, that should be, I'm, I'm just going to use another example of good, good old Ding Dong Liam. Uh, so Reptiles and Research once made a video that said that you should stand out and expose yourself to the sun in order to top up your vitamin D and avoid ever getting catching a virus or cold or whatever it is, he said. This is completely nonsensical. This is busted by the CDC. This is busted by science. Sure, there's small links that say that, you know, uh, a lack of vitamin D could make you more prone to illness. Um, there are links between vitamin D possibly helping people to recover more quickly. But in a lot of these cases, either the people were already vitamin D deficient or there was some other answer as to why these links were stronger in some people than other people. It did not universally apply. And that's why we don't have everybody doing, you know, vitamin D IV bags 24 hours a day. In fact, uh, it's a good idea to limit your amount of vitamin D. Uh, there's some research out there that you can go look up yourself that says that, you know, traditionally we would give vitamin D to elderly because we wanted more calcium to make their bones thicker and all this other good stuff. But there's also counterlinks that say that people that, uh, especially elderly people that were given vitamin D actually increased the rate of injury. So when they did fall, they probably broke something rather than bouncing off the ground. Uh, which of course is, you know, people that are elderly generally bounce, people that are elderly generally hit the ground and break something. Uh, so in those cases, vitamin D are actually being told to reduce the levels of vitamin D. Also counter to popular belief, you can overdose on vitamin D and you can especially overdose small animals on vitamin D because vitamin D is actually a registered rodenticide and the reason that we actually offer UV lamps in the form of sunlight is for the animals to create vitamin D uh, instead of supplementing, supplementing it like we do with humans and the reason that we do that is because the levels that we supplement at could potentially be toxic. So. If we knew the levels to supplement animals at throughout their developmental phases, if we knew the levels to use vitamin D, we wouldn't actually need UV light. That is a fact. 
John Courtney Smith can jump on Animals at Home Network and scream that things are a fact as much as he wants, but the actual fact is that providing vitamin D through diet is the thing that people recommend for animals and for humans, uh, who, which are animals, but I want to make sure people realize I mean humans along with animals. Um, we supplement. We don't tell people to stand out in the sun because the sun is a known carcinogen and dangerous. This one drives me nuts. So everybody that's out there that wants to make these YouTube videos about nebulizers and all this stuff, they don't, it's, it's completely ridiculous nonsense. People doing open surgery in the middle of the internet. This is painful. Uh, and they all claim that the vets don't know what they're doing, so they had to do it themselves. This does not make any sense. If somebody walked up to you and said, my doctor doesn't know what they're doing, so I went ahead and gave myself my own uh, appendix removal, uh, appendectomy, right? That would, hopefully you would be horrified and call the police on that person immediately. Um, that's, uh, that's not how any of this works. If your vet does not know what they're doing, it is your ethical and moral responsibility to find a vet that does know what they're doing. There are a ton of veterinary resources out there where you can email people, where you can contact people online who are actual veterinarians and ask them questions, ask them what you know they should be doing. There are, there are places that hopefully you can go find veterinarians at. However, I'm gonna tell you, if you go onto like an Advancing Herp Husbandry Facebook group or something like that and somebody claims they're a herpetologist that keeps all of their ball pythons at 98% humidity, that person is bananas, that makes no sense. Uh, if you jump on there and the veterinarian is like the ones that show up on Animals at Home Network or the ones that show up you know, in, in some of these other YouTube videos and they claim that anecdotally giving an animal UV automatically makes them smarter and run faster. Those people are completely bananas. They, they go in the bad vet category. However, there are plenty of vets that do know what they're doing. Uh, the only way to find out, of course, is to go and, and you can jump on ARAV, you can search for a vet through that way, you can contact exotic vets in your area, you can ask them how much experience they have with these animals, but you also need to be prepared to understand that you are going to a specialist. And if a person tells you, who is a VMD, who is you know a veterinarian, if, if a person tells you that they suggest putting your leopard gecko on paper towels while it is healing, or while uh, it is taking uh, antibiotics, or while we're testing it for cryptosporidium, you should do that. You should do that because they're telling you that for a reason. The absolute minimal husbandry for that animal may be paper towels. That's the minimum. That doesn't mean that you can't do other things later. They want to eliminate the number of factors that could be different. They want to make sure that you don't have, uh, well, here's one example. So supposedly Go Herping at one point in time claimed that his veterinarians didn't know what they were doing because they couldn't cure a respiratory tract infection in a snake. And then he came back and said it was because the uh, aquarium was full of cat pee. Great, wonderful. So if you had taken that snake out, put it in a tub, lined it with um, paper towels, and treated it as if it was in a medical emergency, then the factor of cat pee, which I don't know how you didn't smell or wash out of the enclosure on the side of the road, I don't know how any of that worked, the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But uh, if you had moved it over to something with paper towels, then you would have been able to eliminate those factors and you would have found the problem earlier. This, once again, is one of those areas where there's a reason that veterinarians have identified the absolute minimal husbandry for things. Uh, husbandry itself is a stupid term, but we'll have a whole video about that later anyway. Uh, now, of course, kind of aligning with the last, uh, the last point, a uh, couple points here, is that you know people in the reptile hobby believe that research is what they want to be true. Whenever they go to do research, and by that I mean they open Google and start typing things, uh, they generally search for the things they want to be true. They search for things like uh, UV light disinfectant, UV light... Uh, good for reptiles like they search for these very biased things and then they go and they collect the first four links slap them into uh, You know plagiarized article on reptophiles and call it a day. That's not research whatsoever That's that's definitely not research when you sit down to do research You should at least Google the opposite of what you think So you have your thesis antithesis synthesis just you know good old Hegel's dialectic something you should have been taught as part of critical thinking uh, is that you receive this information and you perform a synthesis, right? So if I'm telling you that uh, UV light is great and then the opposite of that is UV light is bad and we want to synthesize these ideas together, then we can definitely identify that UV light does have benefits of animals you know, producing vitamin D when they're exposed to it. However, UV light is also a carcinogen and we should limit exposure to it. So your synthesis there should be 
that we should limit exposure to UV light and we should learn a way to do that. It shouldn't be that there was an iguana with bacteria on it and UV light cleared it and that UV light suddenly cures colds and that UV light uh, is a disinfectant. Like, like all these ridiculous things, you never see anybody with a counterpoint. That's not critical thinking. That's like writing a book report from the fifth grade. That's just, it's stupid. It's persuasive writing that most of the time isn't even persuasive, but people somehow fall for it. It's really bad. It's really bad. It's embarrassing. Uh, once again, this is another reason why, you know, the reptile hobby is very small because smart people don't come up and say, this is stupid. This is really stupid. And we need to stop, you know, having this ultra biased things, these filter bubbles where, you know, people are out there trying to replace the bulbs in their house with UV bulbs so that they're smarter and faster and have bigger genitals or whatever the hell they read from some ridiculous Arcadia article. Bad, it's bad. UV light, bad. We have it because we don't know how to supplement with vitamin D. That's the answer. Research that, research those two things. Now, along with research is that people like to say that empirical evidence doesn't count. You know, this is one of those things where people have been keeping reptiles for a very long time. There are a hit list of individuals that you will see all over YouTube, that you'll hear from other people, that have successfully been keeping these animals for a very long time. You can go and observe that. Uh, they can provide you with their own observations. And the problem there is, is that people say, well, that's, that's unethical and it doesn't count. That's, I don't like that and it doesn't count. Um, it's outdated and it doesn't count. Okay, here's, here's the thing though, is once again, just like the other, the other point, you need to learn to synthesize that into something else. If they're using the absolute minimal husbandry, but their animal is indistinguishable from your animal, then there are further improvements to be made. If there's something, some way that you believe that your animal will somehow be more better than somebody else's animal, then you need to come up with a way to qualify or quantify that. Some people have tried to use things like stereotypies where they say that this animal goes out and arches, it back, arches its back in the sunlight or something like that. Okay, match that to something in the wild. Show me that that makes the animal more similar to an animal that, that survives in the wild and then show me that that same behavior is beneficial to the animal in some way. Uh, you know, it's a bit like saying that I, I've seen, you know, wild animals similar to dogs scratch for fleas uh, my animal doesn't scratch for fleas, therefore I need to induce that behavior. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense. That's obviously a negative behavior because your animal's infested with fleas at that point in time. So we need to understand what these stereotypes are for and how they apply to uh, a captive environment. Uh, and that's a whole realm of study itself. It's not just simply looking and saying, oh, my snake is awake in the daytime, therefore uh, my keeping is immaculate because a lot of these animals aren't actually up and moving around in the middle of the day. Uh, in fact, most animals, when it becomes noon, when the UV light becomes the most pronounced, when it is the warmest, uh, are generally avoiding the sun. That's, that's right, avoiding the sun. So no UV, no nothing, they're avoiding the sun. Now, dusk and dawn, of course, are fun times for most animals. Even when somebody says this is a diurnal animal, a lot of the times they're still hiding under trees, they're still avoiding UV light, they're still avoiding direct sunlight. So we can see those stereotypes across the animal kingdom, but for some reason they're celebrated inside of the reptile hobby, which is weird. It's just weird. It's just, it's definitely just weird. Now, of course, on the flip side, we have people saying that modern science doesn't count. Everything is outdated or everything doesn't count because they've been doing this for ding dang 137 years. 137 years of reptile keeping, keeping does not invalidate that we have things like genetic testing, that we have molecular testing for disease. It doesn't invalidate that we can do things like micronutrient surveys, provide more studies, and actually have a better handle on things like cancer and what and the causes of cancer. And then, uh, you know, all of these different aspects are things that still are ways that we can improve animal science, animal science, not animal husbandry, animal science. Uh, and we can use that animal science for our captive animals. Now, uh, of course, those two points line up with everything I don't like is outdated. Now, I'm going to show you an article here shortly that is uh, based in 2022, and it identifies chromatophoromas and reptiles. Now, one of the things that you'll see on these Facebook groups and you'll see in all these places, is people saying that there's never been an animal injured by UV light. And that's not true whatsoever. That's completely nonsensical. One of the reasons that people suggest that you have limited sun exposure is so that you don't develop things like melanomas. 
uh, melanoma, of course, is a problem with your skin. Now, once again, we're going to have somebody that says, I've been standing in the sun for 167 years, uh, and uh, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. Overwhelmingly, the evidence is that overexposure to these types of lights, this type of light, will cause you to get melanomas. Not everyone will get a melanoma, just like not everybody who smokes will get lung cancer, just like everybody that has lung cancer smoked. None of those are direct links. Uh, the fact is that the overwhelming um, recommendation is to limit the amount of UV light because of things like melanomas. Chromatophromas are, I mean, for all intents and purposes, we're going to say that they're similar to melanomas. Now, I'm going to scroll by some pictures that are a little startling that do show some injured animals. Uh, so if you don't want to see that, then look away for a moment. Um, but we are going to jump over to, oh, this isn't actually the article. Of course, yay. So we are going to jump over here. We're going to look at those, those images. So we see a little euro here that has some sort of chromatophoroma underneath his armpit. Uh, we see a couple other animals here that are pretty commonly kept. Uh, and you can see the actual problem here is that they have growths underneath that are identified as chromatophoromas by these individuals. Fun thing here is that if we go and we look at ultraviolet light, as part of, uh, you know, the this is, of course, isn't a direct link. This isn't proven because we rarely get to actually observe a chromatophoroma developing. Um, the thing that actually kickstarts a chromatophoroma, you're not actually going to see in your reptile. You're only going to see the end result of having this big, large mass. Um, now, this does, and I'm going to highlight this section for people. Hopefully, my head's not in the way. Um, there is a mention here. We expose these animals to artificial UV light. The theory, of course, is that introducing these animals to these UV lights is something that could be causing these chromatophoromas. So we do have an indication that we could injure these animals with ultraviolet light. So if you see here, this was published 2022, revised uh, 2022, this is all 2022. So the typical way that the reptile hobby usually handles things is that they say everything is outdated except for what they like. This was done in 2022. So uh, does that mean that it completely invalidates everything that Arcadia has ever posted? No, I, I wish it did. But that unfortunately is not the way that these things work. The reptile hobby would like for that to be the way that these things work, but it is not. Because we have more information, this is additional information for us to be able to synthesize with our understanding of reptile keeping and animal science. This is something we need to synthesize. So if exposure to UV light has a potential for causing an injury, how can we actually limit the exposure to UV light for these animals? Does my bearded dragon need two hours of sun or does he actually need 12 hours of sun? Um, that's the question here, is because exposure to this light is something that could cause injury, both in humans and in animals, then how do we synthesize this together without pointing fingers and claiming everything is outdated except for the thing that I like? It should be pretty obvious to everybody except the little tiny rinky-dinky reptile hobby where this stuff gets away, people get away with doing this stuff where everything is outdated except for the thing they like. It's ridiculous. Um, of course, the other part of reptile hobby is everybody needs my criticism. Now, you might call this a little bit of hypocritical because I'm here making fun of several sources that are bananas, according to me. Uh, and, of course, I will give you reasons that they're bananas so that you can't scream ad hominem. Yeah, that's a reference to the earlier slide. However, what you have is people that jump in and say, oh, well, your leopard gecko keeping isn't good enough because you don't have a DHP. Now, people have keep, kept these animals successfully without a DP projector. Um, how do you qualify that a DP projector is somehow better for your animal? Is there a way that you can quantify behaviors? Is there a way that you can quantify weight gain? Is there some way that you can quantify why this is better? And the answer is nobody can. So without actually having support for reasons to have this type of thing and reasons that somebody should be ashamed for not having a DHP, uh, they go into just firing off these things and claiming things like, oh, I feel sorry for your animals. I feel sorry for your animals is not criticism. That is just a huge ding-dong thing to do. Don't do that. That's awful. Uh, when delivering criticism, generally you will hear people, like think of a movie review, 
uh, where they will start off with something neutral or positive, then add in any possible potential negatives, and then end with something neutral or positive. This, of course, is a good old sandwich, right? You'll probably see this reference in a bunch of other places. So if you jump on Facebook and try firing off that somebody's unethical because they don't have UV lamps inside of their car or up their butt or wherever the hell you think that UV lamps go, uh, that's not criticism. That's just attacking somebody on the internet. And if you just randomly attack somebody on the internet, it's unlikely they're going to accept your criticism. So don't tell me that screaming about ridiculous stuff about UV lamps and telling me that iguanas had bacteria and when exposed to UV that they couldn't find the bacteria anymore. This is bananas. It's not credit criticism. It's not, it doesn't even make a point. Uh, don't tell me that UV lights increase the wound closure rate because hopefully your animals in captivity aren't bleeding constantly because that's, that's what, I don't know if people don't understand that wound closure rate means that there's open wounds. If your animal has a lot of open wounds, we have a whole bunch of other things to deal with other than you trying to criticize somebody else for not having UV lamp. I hope everybody understands that. So that's the top 10 things that uh, the reptile hobby will always get wrong. There will never be a year where we don't have people that jump up and try to reference sunshine doctor stuff from the 1970s regarding UV light. We will never have a year where people will say, okay, well, my animal is safe and healthy, even though I don't have some topsoil from Home Depot because I believe that that's natural. There will never be a year where we don't have somebody jump up and say everything everybody else knows is outdated. In the six months that I've spent in this hobby, I've learned the immaculate pinnacle of animal science. We're never not going to have that. Um, so I guess just in closing, keep in mind that you can go out and you can look things up. You can jump on Google Scholar. Make sure that you're not only Googling the thing that you want to be true, but also Google the thing you don't want to be true so that you can synthesize those things together. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, the actual fact, John Courtney Smith likes to scream that that's a fact uh, in, in the middle of the videos uh, when it's not facts whatsoever. Um, pretty funny, pretty funny overall. But uh, when you take two pieces of information and you synthesize them together, whether it aligns with your bias or not, you will be better off. You will absolutely be better off. UV light is good because it helps our animals to produce vitamin D. Vitamin D is required for uh, developmental reasons to avoid hyperparathyroidism, etc. UV light is what we use to deliver vitamin D, but UV light is a known carcinogen. So if we were to synthesize these together, the question should be, is there a way that we can supplement with vitamin D? That's one synthesis. And in order for us to be able to supplement with vitamin D, we have to have a way to judge how much vitamin D we're getting and not deliver it in toxic amounts. Um, contrary to, to what some people say on YouTube, you actually can overdose on vitamin D. As humans, we don't die, but we do have several different problems. You can go look these up on what a vitamin D overdose looks like. Um, I imagine it looks like, you know, some combination of Liam Sinclair and John Courtney Smith and um, what was that ridiculous doctor of nursing dude um, that Liam knocked off? I don't remember his name, but he was all over the pandemic promoting things like ivermectin and all that other good stuff. And Liam used to knock him off and it's really funny. Um, Dr. John something. Anyway, remind me in the comments who that person is. UV light good, but UV light bad but being able to supplement with vitamin D really hard. Therefore, our best opportunity right now is to provide UV light. However, can we reduce the amount of UV light? Uh, is there a reason that we have to use 10 to 12 hours a day or eight to 12 hours a day or something like that? Or can we just do two hours? Uh, there's a lot of research, of course, on human vitamin D. And this, of course, depends on many things, including your skin color and everything else. Um, but the exposure to sunlight that, that, that is possibly good for you uh, is a matter of minutes or even a whole hour per week. It is not 12 hours in a single day. It is not that. And so with the assumption of things like the study that I've showed you where we identified chromatoferomas and reptiles and that those are possibly similar to injuries that we see in other animals from UV light, then is there a way that we can either supplement through vitamin D or limit the exposure to prevent injuries from chromatoferoma. These are the things that the reptile hobby should be considering. Uh, how do we move over to LEDs and stop using these antiquated bulbs that are under bulb bands? Of course, Arcadia is going to skirt that because they're going to say that all of their incandescent bulbs and all of the deals that they have with bulb manufacturers 
are important because they are specialty use lamps. So instead of dumping money into something like LEDs, they're going to dump money into dimmable T5s that don't make any sense. Oh boy. I don't know if the reptile hobby will ever recover from any of this. Uh, I think it will always be this way. Let me know what you think in the comments.